And this is, again, the session of Art of Radio for WGDR and WGDH new programmers. So again, we're going to be starting tonight with our, um, with our, our panelists, and we're still missing one panelist. So uh, I'm going to hope that they jump in here kind of midway through. Um, but to kind of start here, um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. There we go. And I shared it in an email in advance, but uh, we are really, I don't know, I was going to use the word blessed, but I didn't want to have that, I want that in a secular kind of way uh, as an intention here. Uh, we're really lucky. We're really, we've got some really excellent folks tonight that are going to share their perspectives about show making and content making. And in no particular order, um, the folks you're going to hear from tonight are Amy. She hosts Amy's Kids Show on Saturday mornings. You're going to hear from Bill. Hear from Bill. He makes a great music show called Hitting the Note that airs on Thursdays and still has a bit of a rerun going, but it won't be for long because you all are coming online and uh, taking our reruns offline, which is a good thing. Uh, we got Nathan on here, aka DJ Z Point, not to give away his true identity, but he's also got a great uh, music show that you hear on Saturday nights. We've got Erica, producer, and I have to say it, Erica, I'm sorry, P producer of the Peabody winning uh, Rumble Strip podcast. If you are not a listener of Rumble Strip, you are missing out. And I really uh, highly recommend you. I'm doing a call to action. This is not know what to do on the air. See, this is your first te test, a call to action. Uh, if you haven't tuned into that, please make a, a point to do so. It is capturing the voices and stories and sounds of Vermont in such a way that I've never heard before. And if you're going to start with an episode, get a box of tissues and listen to Finn and the, and the Bell. Um, it's just, it's part of our listening area. And it's just, uh, it's one of the finest pieces of audio I've ever heard. Sorry, Erica, but I'm just going to go ahead and fan kid about you for a second. Um, we've also got John here. Uh, he's a longtime Vermont journalist, uh, part of a lot of major mastheads, as they say in media, and he's the chair of our programming committee. Um, Erica is also part of our programming committee. I want to make sure to note that. Uh, and then finally, we've got Joseph, who is host of longtime host of Gathering Peace, a uh, great interviewer um, with lots of ranging content, uh, kind of peace, et cetera, is kind of how I think about it, Joseph. Um, and that airs on Tuesday mornings. And Joseph is also part of our CBCR board, the founding board member, in fact. Um, so it helped us pull it all off together. So that's who we're meeting tonight. I just wanted to kind of share a quick slide to kind of have names uh, up there. You know, it's Zoom, so I'm going to try to pin the speaker. Um, and the format that we're going to do tonight is to give each of these fine folks about eight to 10 minutes to speak to the show or the content they create, how they approach it, um, how they curate it, how it's might maybe evolved. They have some prompts that they're gonna be working towards. So they're gonna kind of, kind of do their own angle of answering those questions. Uh, and as you listen, I'm hoping that you can make note of questions that you wanna ask them. Um, Cause we're gonna go through each of the panelists first and then we're gonna have some Q and A, uh, kind of like a standard panel. Uh, you know, when, they, when we used to do these things in person, you know, the panel would sit up front and we'd, you know, go up to the microphone afterwards. So that's what we're going to do for the first hour together. Um, before I hand it over to the panel, and um, I'll let uh, the panelists know that, um, Erica, I'm going to actually probably have you go first, because you're the first in my corner here, so just be ready. But I'm wondering, overall, are there any other questions from anybody in the room tonight about what we're doing tonight, or uh, anything that I just rumbled through that um, wasn't clear? All right. So we are gonna start with Erica and in the chat, I'll put the order of panelists so you all can get ready um, and with that jet fuel of nerves and excitement. Uh, and Erica, I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you the start here and let's see if I can do the, the pinning here. Um, all right, go for it, thank you. Um, so I'm nervous, uh, but you know, one of the things I was, I, I think I wanna talk a little bit about interviewing and then the, because that's, you know, half of what I do. And I, I, I just want to say that I've never scheduled an interview that I didn't hope would be canceled. So <laughs> like, the really like the, I've never not been nervous for an interview ever. And like clammy hands nervous because I'm about to stick a mic in someone's face and that's asking a lot. I'm, I'm about to sort of, um, to ask personal questions of somebody and that's asking a lot of somebody but in a microphone kind of um creates a certain charge in the air that a regular conversation doesn't so it sounds like it's regular conversation but it's it's not regular conversation um but i figured i would just you know i'm going to talk about interviewing and i figured i would just share a few things that i think about when i'm doing it which is 
you know, you're, I know that everybody, a lot of people here are going to be doing live shows, which is really different from what I do. I edit the hell out of the tape that I get. But still, an interview is this really rarefied experience between usually two people. Um, and the way that I approach everyone that I interview, whether they're seven or 94, the thing that I always feel is that this is a person who's a, like a world expert in who they are, right? They are the only, they are the world expert. And I also really believe that they know something that if I knew it, I could get through my day better. That's kind of like the, the, the selfishness in the show is I'm like, what do you know that I wish that, that, that I could understand? And so part of that is I'm trying to, you can't judge somebody and do a good interview at the same time. You can do one or the other, but you can't do both. So what I'm trying to do is figure out how they arrived to where they are, teasing apart, this happened, this happened, this happened, and this is why you believe what you do. The goal I feel for, for in my show is to try to sort of climb into the front seat of another person's life. And I think that, you know, um, you can do that in, in all manner of shows. Um, but the it, real curiosity about another human is you can hear that and um, it's a palpable thing. Humans are really smart and their ears are smart and they can hear real hunger or interest in, 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 the, in the interviewer, which of course means you want to be listening, which means that you've maybe thought in advance about what it is you want to talk with this person about. Um, actually, famously, like one of the one of, I had an interview at WGDR years ago where um i was driving from uh, like middlebury or someplace and greg shero was with me and he was from like rutland or someplace and we got there and the very first like it's live right so the very first question was now who are you guys again and <laughs> i was like it was i was actually totally charming i was like he doesn't know who we are it's so it was like performance art which was great you know but I would George, sort of suggest that you know who you're talking to before you, you know, turn it on. But and I have like used your like I just usually go into to an interview trying to imagine the experience of the other person, not a list of questions, though sometimes I do, but I've imagined a conversation with them. And then the conversation starts and you are thinking about lunch and you're thinking about I'm scared and I'm bored and this is terrible and this is wonderful I don't know all of these that that's all fine too that chatter learning how to sort of balance the chatter out with the actual deep presence of being with somebody those two things can happen at the same time um I always feel like the best place you can get to with another person is where you're both where you have both arrived to a place where you're like I don't know like you've found an island that's an island that can only be made by these two people and you are deep equal and you've now arrived at a place where you you are both asking what's going on and there's a sound to that and it's there's a humility that's required in getting there and it's a really beautiful place to be with another person um I think that also allowing for silence in conversations not initially like at first you need to establish trust with somebody and you are, whether you're nervous or not, you are in charge and you have to act like it. Like if you've got a mic in someone's face, you better be taking care of them because they're like, they don't even know if they're on, like they, they, sometimes people think like I'm on television, like they don't know what it means. So if you've got a mic in someone's face, take care of them and eye contact and listening and follow up questions. And then as that trust develops, you can feel it because you're human and you've been to parties and you know what it's like. Once that penny drops down, they actually sometimes stop asking questions. And that's an interesting feeling too between two people. Sometimes when I stop, um, the next thing that they say is really the most beautiful thing that happens. And it's not because of anything I've done or anything I've asked. It's just that I've given us a, 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 a break. Like it doesn't have to be answer, question, question, answer. You can just be with another person. And sometimes it's quiet. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I want to know next. So I'm just going to think about it. Like all of that not knowing is really useful in interviews. Um, 
And you can also, like people can say, no, I always tell people if I ask a question that's stupid or you don't want to answer it, you can just tell me I don't want to answer that. Or that's the wrong question. What you should be asking is this. Um, but I think mostly like this, I'm so goddamn excited about GDR because this has the potential to sound like where we live. And I can't think of anything that I'd rather listen to. And I just pray that people are looking to talk with people who are deeply unlike themselves. Like look for opportunities to talk with people who have nothing to do with your point of view in the world and figure and like see what happens between two people who are like that. Like find people to talk to who we don't get to hear from on the radio. And if you want to like, you know, do it like I do it outside. I walk around town with a microphone. You can do that too. You can get that tape, make something with it, or just keep it loose and bring it into your live show. Like go out into our community and get the sound of it and bring it back to the station. That's all I got. I mean, anything else? That seems like enough, right? I talked a lot. That's that is great, Erica. You almost okay. almost make me want to do a uh a talk show, an interview show. <laughs> I'm a music, I'm a, such a not music quite. nerd. Not quite, not quite. Although it, it's, I mean, it's being, it's human, it's humaning, right? You know, it's like figuring out how to make a connection with someone so they create an authentic conversation with you. So thank you so much, Erica. Um, and Erica doesn't have a current show, by the way. Rumble Strip is not on the air, although we have talked about it and figuring out ways to potentially bring the back catalog into the, into the, um, into the program at some point. All right, I'm gonna hand the mic to Joseph next, please. Well, first I wanna say, Erica, that was just wonderful to hear what you do in order to create your, your show. Um, I see genius at least on three levels. One is who you decide to interview, and the other is the interview itself. And then the other is the edited program that you present us with. They are just remarkable, wonderful vignettes about being alive in Vermont in the 21st century. And so thank you. Thank you so much for that work and also for your great presentation. My show is somewhat different. I, 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 uh, I love what Erica said about climb into the front seat of another person's life and get to get them to speak in a way that establishes trust, that you take care of them, not knowing really where it's going. These are the kinds of things that Erica raised up. And I think, wow, that's what makes her program so, her shows so riveting for the listener. My show is somewhat different. I have a, a, a purpose and it's not necessarily to get the person to talk about themselves, although I do want that to happen in my show. My show is basically uh, built from the work I was doing when I started the show 25 years ago. I was the Vermont program director for the American Friends Service Committee. It's a Quaker organization that works on peace and justice issues. So my show is intentionally uh, title Gathering Peace, the idea being like a gathering storm, we're gathering peace. And it was to talk with people who are in actively working toward a more just and peaceful society. So it was once removed from the immediacy of their personal lives, and I knew that. But I do try once in a while to get to, well, why are you doing this work after we've talked about the work for a while? So I, I do try to establish that trust that Erica talks about, but not quite on the intimate level that her wonderful program uh, enables us to really get to see the people who plow our roads, who do the things every day that make our society work, and to finally hear them on the radio with Erica talking with them is is just a real treat as i say my show is a little different so i have to think about when i start thinking about what show i'm going to have next week one of the things i think about or, or sometimes if i'm really smart i'm able to produce a show three and four weeks before it's going to be actually aired but that doesn't always happen because of the nature of my my show i try to react to what is happening in the world that people need to know more about and then find 
people who are either working on that issue or who have worked on it in the past and know enough to be able to throw some light on what it might be. It could be a war going on. It could be uh, climate uh, destruction. It could be uh, racial tensions. It could be poverty, homelessness, whatever it is. My program tries to look at all those issues and to talk with people who are working on them and the idea is, is to not only inform, but to help people move from concern about those issues into action to address them. What I'd like to do is uh, read to you, if you wouldn't mind indulging me a bit, years ago when WGDR was still part of Goddard College, we had a process for programmers to uh, more of what is a... Um, a self-directed inquiry, which if you know anything about Goddard College education uh, format, my wife taught there for 26 years, so we're both very embedded with it. I, I taught for a number of years myself. Uh, the whole idea of uh, self-directed inquiry, where in the case of Goddard, the student would determine her or his uh, area of study and how they were going to pursue it and then talk with the program director in order to make it an academically secure and academically um, important uh, topic. So we were asked to do that as programmers, to think about our program and to answer several questions. And so I'd, I'd like, by way of helping you to understand, one of the things that I think is very important is to know what it is you're trying to do when you produce your show. And obviously I'm talking with people who are doing uh, interview shows, but I think it's also relevant for people who do music. Why are you playing what you play? You know, what, what, what is it that you're trying to, to do other than just entertain, which is good enough, but are you doing, trying to do something else? So here's what we were asked. One of the first in questions was intentionality. Describe the radio program you want to produce, including areas of focus. So I had to think about that. Now, at this point, I had been doing the show for about 15 years, and I hadn't quite written down what it was I was trying to do, other than when I was working for the service committee, I would have to write a staff report and say why I had different guests on, but I never quite put it together in terms of why am I doing this show at this time now. So here's what I said at that point. Gathering Peace is intended to be a program that informs listeners about issues related to justice and peace broadly defined in their community, in Vermont, in their nation, and internationally. The program provides in-depth discussions about such events and issues, how they relate to other issues, and to the listener's desire for a more just and peaceful world. Gathering Peace provides a forum for voices which the corporate mainstream media too often overlook and helps listeners learn what may, they might do to work for positive change. The format is a mixture of live interviews, announcements, listener calls in, this is when the show was live, which it will be again soon, and readings. So I've begun to add recorded talks, presentations, and et cetera, et cetera. So I had to sit down and think enough deeply in order to be able to write that out. And, and I want to say that it helped me to focus on who I was going to be asking on my program, what kinds of questions I wanted to ask of them, and what I hope the listeners would take away from each show. So that was the way I approach my show. That is the way I approach my show, because the major concern I have is how do we create a more peaceful and just world? How do we engage others in wanting to do that? Many of us have concerns about this issue. Can a radio show help people move from concern to action in order to make that world? So that, that's that been the guiding principle that I have done my shows. How I go about doing it? Well, luckily, because I have worked in this field for a long time, I have many acquaintances and friends around the country and in different parts of the world who are working on this issue. So I tap into them 
when I want to do a show about a specific issue. But as I said earlier, oftentimes it will be because of what's happening in, in the news. What's the headline? Uh, the international uh, panel on climate change just had a, uh, a report out that talked about the dire situation that we're in regarding environmental destruction and the climate. Well, there's going to be a show on that pretty soon. I'm in discussion with a few people who will be my guests on that. I, if I don't know a lot about the issue, I do a lot of research. Someone, uh, one of the new programmers wrote to me last week and asked, how much time do I spend in putting together a program? And I, I said, well, it depends on how much I know about the issue itself, for one, but generally between three and four hours, sometimes six, sometimes more. Um, depending on, again, the issue itself and what I'm trying to bring out from the complex issues that we're confronted with in a 53-minute conversation to, to help people to understand it a little more than they did before they turned on the radio. Um, I love what Erica said about building trust. Um, sometimes I will talk, since, especially since I've been doing Zoom, uh, since the pandemic, I'll talk with people whom I don't know a few minutes before we start recording uh, to establish a rapport and get a sense of them and mm, how they might respond to various kinds of questions. People often ask me, well, what kinds of questions do you are you going to be asking? Can you write down those questions so we can prepare? I just had that request recently. And my response was, well, these are the areas that I want to talk with you about, but in terms of specific questions, uh, I, I think unrehearsed answers make for a more lively radio and a more authentic response on the part of people rather than something that they uh, type into their computer and then read off to me or have prepared in such a way that there's no longer that authentic immediacy of a conversation going on, but more of somebody telling. And uh, I don't want the telling as much as I want a conversation so that we begin to get the some of the human element re regarding these, these particular issues that can, for some people, be very painful to hear about. So those are the kinds of things I think about. Those are the kinds of things that I try to accomplish with my uh, radio show. You can tell he's a radio guy, everybody. 10 minutes on the dot. My little timer just started going off. Well done, Joseph. Thank you so much for your piece there. Um, all right. We're going to continue with our panel here. We had uh, two off the, the bat for speaking towards talk and interview and the approach there. And now we're going to switch to some music uh, with Bill speaking to uh, his music show and his approach to um, pulling that together each and every week. Take it away, Bill. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, my name is Bill Hahn. The show's hitting the note. I'm on Thursdays, 2 to 4 p.m. And uh, I'm just coming up on my sixth anniversary of being on the air. And it's terrific. You guys, the new people are going to just love, love doing it. And um, it's a music show. And I often get asked, first question, well, what do you play? And my answer usually is quite short and easy. And what I usually say is, I'll tell you what I don't play, and that's opera and, and new country. Other than that, everything else is game. And that is pretty much pretty much the truth. And um, I think the way I approach this is I want to entertain my audience, but I also want to challenge them. And I think I do that in two ways. One is that I mix the genres of music I play up pretty drastically throughout the show. I have five music segments. And each one stands alone as, as a genre or a theme. And the other one is, you know, basically, you're not, you're not going to be hearing Led Zeppelin or the Rolling Stones on my show. I, I try to discover the unknown nuggets of music artists and all the genres that I play and bring them to you for your music listening. And maybe you'll find one or two that, you know, you haven't heard before and you want to dive in more uh, by yourself and, and, and get to know it better. So I, I think I challenge the, uh, the listener in, in those two ways. To give you an example of that, my show that played today, my first segment was uh, an all-female 
rock blues segment uh, with all new artists. My following segment was the Berlin School of Electronic Music. And then the, my third segment is always either a featured album or featured artist of the week. That is my anchor for my whole show. That's what I, I build the rest of the show around. This week, it was a gentleman named Wayne Shorter. He was one of the greatest jazz saxophonists uh, ever to play the horn. He had a 70 year career and passed away recently. I was also a while back in the music business. He was a client of mine. So I had a, some of a personal uh, relationship with him and I reviewed his whole career from back in 1961 when he started with Art Blakely's Jazz Messengers to his most recent album, which he released just two years ago before he passed away. That segment's always my, uh, my anchor. That following segment, uh, Yesterday was a segment I called Back to the Fillmore East, where I recreate some of the great shows from the Fillmore East, which was open from 1968 to 71. And this week, it was the December 20th and 21st performances by the James Cotton Blues Band, Deep Purple, and Creedence Clearwater Revival. And I put together what the show sounded like for that show by getting playlists from where they, what they played those nights and then building the, building the performance. And then I finished with... Uh, some te contemporary rock blues to, to end the show. And I basically rotate different uh, genres every week. So just because you're hearing an electronica from the Berlin School this week, you could might hear, you know, dub from Jamaica the following week or um, bluegrass. So I, I try to mix it up and I, I know in my heart of hearts that probably 90% of the people that listen to my show aren't going to like everything, but that's okay. I, 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 don't, I don't have any problem with that. But what I try to do is educate them, even if they're not appreciating maybe something specifically that they're listening to. And because a lot of it is, is obscure, I, I, I do spend a good amount of time talking about um, some of the artists I think, or the, the songs that I think need an explanation. And I put my show together well in advance. I try to have it ready to go because I do remote. I, I recorded remote now for three years since, uh, since COVID started. And as, as Lou well knows, I probably will not go back into the studio because me personally, I'm, I, I'm not good on my feet talking and I can control the quality of my show much better uh, when I'm doing it remotely, I can clean up my mistakes, which I make plenty of, let me tell you. <laughs> and, and so don't you know, folks get used to making mistakes. It, it happens. Um, I build everything off of my own personal music collection, which at this point is, um, about 15,400 albums. I just passed 170,000 songs and it grows every week. And there's across all genres and I build it in a, in my computer on a wonderful, wonderful media music software uh, called J River Media Center, which if anyone wants to know more about it, please contact me. If you're going to build a remote show from home, it's just a terrific, terrific program that is head and, head and heels above any other. So obviously the first thing, the most important thing you're going to do when you're building your show remotely or live, the main difference is, you know, Putting, selecting your songs, selecting the, their order, selecting what what about them is going to make you make this an impactful presentation. That's the most important part of what you're going to do. And I I think any other music program, especially Lou, would agree. You know, it starts with the music. And if 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 you don't put together some compelling music, and everything else that's going to go in your show is just not going to be as impactful. And I have a, basically a 15 step checklist that I go through every week. Uh, that I, I just tick off as I go. And the first is build build your playlist. And, and I do that. And then I export it from my media center onto an Excel spreadsheet. And then I remove my selected songs from my suggested list. Because I, I always keep a suggested lists in my computer because you don't want to be uh, starting from scratch every week trying to find songs. It's just the longer you do it, the harder it is. So you should always be working as far in advance as you can. Then I enter all the information about the show into my featured artists and album tracker. So I make sure that I don't play the same album, the same song more than once. I try to play songs only once or maybe twice forever. Then I import the, my playlist into Spinatron so that there is my Spinatron playlist for the for people to see. Then I put together a six page 
show plant, which is basically everything I'm going to do in the show plus all my script. And I, I put that together. Then I enter into my spreadsheet for not all the artists, but the artists or the songs that I, I think need explanation. Something about that song that makes it a compelling song or something about that artist that makes it a compelling artist. And that's that's a really important thing when you're if, if you're going to go the route that I'm going and play unknown music, if you don't put it in context, it really kind of gets lost. You know, if you're playing something that's known, you don't have to do it. But if you're playing like I do, the you know, something like the Fort Mudge Memorial Dunk, nobody knows who that is. You've got to put it in context what it is. So that's the next step. Then I. So I go onto the uh, I go onto the computer and I select my artists and album info for my selected artists of the week. I, I get as much info as I need uh, to explain to them why they are featured artists at the featured album of the week and explain about the album and about the artist and that uh, and that and what's important for them to know. And I print all of my materials, which usually comes out about ten or twelve pages in between all the documents I'm, I'm printing. Then I edit my artist and album info so I know exactly what I'm going to want to say about the featured artists of the week. And then I assembled my pre recorded show, True Audacity, which Lou, am I correct? Is going to be a, um, a whole session on that? Yep, that's going to be next week. Okay, that's going to be really important to you folks. And Audacity, at least for me, I, I was forced into it at COVID and I, I taught myself, and it can be intimidating at first, but just work it. And you'll get it after a while. It, it can be a little frustrating at first. Just work it and, you, and you, it'll come around. And it's really, it's, for freeware, it's, it's very, very, very good. And then, and then I assemble the show. And that usually takes three, three and a half hours. If I'm really flying fast, two and a half hours. And I assemble it into my one hour and 57 uh, minutes uh, show. And then... Um, the last thing is to upload it to the station, to the robot, and the show is ready to go. And uh, that's pretty much what I do. Uh, the only other two things I'd like to tell you to make sure you do as you get going is to make sure to record your own show promo for all of us to play. Very, very important. And it'll, it's a way for you to get known outside of your show. And especially when you're new, you're going to need that. And the other thing is to cross promote your show and other other uh, programmer shows on your show. And I, I think probably we'll be talking to you about that more, but both of those things really help us all to get other people listening to your show and your per people listening to our show. And uh, let's see, I think that's pretty much it, Lou. Right, uh, right on, Bill, thank you so much. Again, everybody keeping right on this like timing thing. This is this is a neat little trick you'll pick up as you're part of being radio. You'll be on time for everything in your life now. And when somebody asks you to talk for 10 minutes, it'll like be like, yep, I got it. Don't need, need, need a clock. So, Bill, thank you so much. One of the reasons I was excited for Bill to speak to his process of his show is because I knew he has such a strong structure. And we don't nothing that you're hearing tonight is required by any of you with your process. We are, we're really trying to represent lots of different approaches to interviews, to talk shows, to um, to music shows. Uh, and you kind of need to try on and figure out what works like with many things in one's life. And so uh, thank you so much, Bill, for walking us through that process there. And I'm sure he'd be happy, to, more than happy to share you examples of his uh, various different structures there too, if folks really are, um, are into that kind of process. So thank you, Bill. All right, uh, next, and actually he, uh, his piece there about promos for each other, it is especially helpful when you're doing a certain type of show to play promos for shows of that type of show. In other words, people who listen to music shows tend to want to listen to other music shows. People who tend to listen to talk shows want to listen to other talk shows. And so if we have promos for each other's shows, that's how you're going to gain more listeners. I mean, we are, the best thing about radio is that we are a self-perpetuating machine of promotion, right? We just do nothing but talk about ourselves. So uh, help us talk about ourselves more, right? Um, okay. And we'll talk about promos a little bit more. It's Pretty simple. It's recording uh, through Audacity and uh, submitting about a 30 or a 60 second spot. Um, and Bill's actually our secret uh, inside guy on uh, helping with production too. So I know he'd be more than happy to help folks um, do that. Without further ado, we'll keep moving with our panel here. Everyone's doing great. Up next, I'd like to welcome John uh, to the spotlight, so to speak. I love this, this like spotting people here. It's like a, 
Great, thanks. Yeah, when you spot me, you'll see the disarray. I hope you don't get freaked <laughs> out by the mess. Um, hi, everyone. I want to just say welcome. Thank you so much for going through the effort of applying and, and putting yourself out there to be on the radio and to bring new stuff to WGDR and, and uh, Central Vermont Community Radio. I just, you're taking uh, such a huge personal leap, I think, if you've never been on the radio before. Um, I, I guess, I, and, and I think you'll get so much out of it. And I'm just really grateful that, that you, that you're here and, and took it upon yourselves to, to try this. Um, I guess I want to just talk about the role of the journalist, at least how I've seen it. Um, my, my story is a little different than um, Bill's, who's, you know, a music host, or Erica, who really kind of just gets the personal story. I went after issues, and Joseph, same, uh, pursuing sort of issues and, and, and interviews for change. I, I, I kind of followed issues over my career, whether it was environment, I did a lot of environmental stories, um, electric utilities, kind of stuff that would, would make you crazy if you think about it, but are really important uh, in the long run. Um, and, and, and healthcare, you know, all of these things that, that need somebody to explain and, and, and synthesize. And what I saw my job as doing, and I came to radio later in my career, was just, you know, finding out what other people needed to know didn't know, didn't know how to know, or how to find out rather, and then being the sort of channel for that. Um, so surrogate, you know, in the, in the most idyllic sense, surrogate public, if you, if you will. So, you know, if that was early on, I was covering select boards, you know, town planning commissions, um, and, and then looking into I, I covered the city of Burlington way back when and, and just what they were doing and, and sort of things that, that, that people didn't know and, and, and maybe um, were a public issue. So it, it, it wasn't that I saw myself as, you know, um, having my own thing. I was more of a conduit for the issues that I identified. And that's, you know, if we can talk about objectivity and that's where objectivity goes out the door because I decided for the most part in my career what I wanted to write about. Um, and so I, I love being outside, I love the environment. So I wrote a lot of environmental stories um, and I tried to be fair about the presentation of it. Um, yet th those, you know, if I was a baseball fan, I would have been a baseball writer. But anyway, that's that's sort of the threshold issue for me about objectivity. Um, it goes out the window when it <clears throat> comes to individual choices of what you pursue. Um, I, I wanted to maybe talk a bit about what radio can do that, that print can't. Um, and this is sort of, again, through the lens of, of journalism. I was a print reporter for many years, I, um, writing for newspapers, magazines, um, and because of the situation at the paper I worked, I was looking for another job and Vermont Public Radio was looking for a reporter. And I knew that I'd have to like be on the radio and that made me nervous. And then I knew that my stories would be shorter and that made me nervous. And I was talking to a, a friend of mine, a colleague, and she said, wow, that's awesome. You get, to, you get to put people on the radio. You get to put like what they sound like and what they're saying on the radio. And, you know, I, obviously I'd been quoting people for 10 years, you know, in those little marks. But as you know, and um, radio, audio voices, go into your brain and, and into the emotional cord that's in there. You can do something with airing somebody's voice that you could never do with the printed word on a page unless you're Shakespeare um, or you know 
somebody else like that. Um, so it was a breakthrough for me, and and I, it's it's sort of funny in retrospect because it's so it's so obvious. But I was stuck in this information gathering, document finding um, mode that it that it was just an eye opener, and and I sort of surrendered to the idea that I'll actually have to have my voice on the air. Um, so. I started out more or less as uh, an investigative reporter. Um, and that brings up the, the notion, and I hope this comes into folks who are doing talk shows or even music shows, um, that anybody is, is a source. Uh, this is fundamental to what Erica does. Um, anybody can tell you a story and, and most people know things that other people don't that is important to the rest of us. So you don't have to go for the public officials. You can go for the people um, who work for, for, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but for work for an agency, if, you, if they'll talk to you, you can go for, you know, the, the person who is on the sidelines, but was affected by what happened. Um, that is, that's even true if you're covering breaking news and you sort of have to talk to the officials. Um, when you're doing, journalism, um, and I had this notion that the the truth of something was, you know, what I was trying to get at. So um, you, you have to be fair in, in what you present, and that includes being fair about yourself and, and what you bring to the story. Um, so if you're, and I had to do this once, my sister worked for the Park Service, and I ended up doing a story about the National Park Service. I had to say that that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, that was uh, a fact. Um, and actually she was, <laughs> she was the source, but we put it out there. And, and I think the disclosure made the story funny and maybe even more personal, um, but you have to be fair and honest with, with the audience. Um, you have to be fair and honest with how you present yourself to the audience. So, um, you know, in Vermont, there's even a, a one party rule, like I can record you and use that information without telling you I'm recording you, but that's that's not right. People have the right to know when they're being recorded. Um, if, if and, and similarly, it's really unadvisable. It's bad. I think it's kind of immoral to, to uh, pretend you're somebody else when you're trying to find out information, unless you know, unless there's a crime committed and then you should go somewhere else with it. Um, I don't know where I am in terms of the 10 minutes loop, but I I guess I can talk a bit about writing. Um, yeah, John, you've got about 30 seconds, I'd say. Okay, <laughs> well, we can save that for the Q&A. All right. But it's a lot easier than it. It doesn't have to be intimidating as it feels often. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> yeah, the, the journalistic integrity piece, the thinking about um, you know news and, and and being a news source, a fact source, a uh, the, the venue of sources to get more information out there, I think is really a powerful one and one that is very much a hallmark of what community radio is about. Uh, we are trying to connect neighbors to neighbors, but also share information that is critical to our neighbors and to our communities. And there's a lot of creative ways to do that. Uh, you know, just because it, there's traditional interview shows or news shows doesn't mean that, as John was just saying, music shows can incorporate this in some way or more creative shows, shows that are kind of educational in lean that maybe do a little music, maybe do a little bit of um, clips from different things and and uh, infusing that as an educational experience or frankly, even an artistic experience. That's what shows, I think, what that's what radio shows are. They're ultimately standalone artistic pieces at the end of the day, um, no matter the genre. So thanks, John. Um, all right, we're going to keep going here. We have two more panelists, and then we're going to open it up to some Q&A. Um, so Nathan, you are up next. Let me find you in my, my journey of the boxes here. There you are. Great. I'm going to pin you. Thanks, Lou. Um, I don't normally use this microphone, but I hope it sounds all right. You, you sound great. Yeah, you sound great. Um, I'm going to start my timer, too, to even help keep track a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess without getting too carried away with the origin story, I kind of started in radio when I was about five years old. 
my mom helped teach me to read early on. I was a, it's like, whatever, I was an early reader. Anyway, my dad was, had a, my dad worked in radio and he, being the proud parents they were, they brought me in to like read the weather. Like they, they, they were, they wanted to, my dad, he was like, oh, why don't you read the weather? So like he would bring me in as a kid onto his show. Um, it, like he's, I would read the weather report every once in a while. Um, so some of my earliest memories of being a smaller man are um, be, hanging around in Studio B, we'll call it. Uh, my dad had a radio show on Sunday mornings uh, on WSKI, which is an AM radio station down here. They used to play pop music. And um, anyway, he would be doing his show on Sunday mornings and I would be hanging around the studio. I thought it was, I would make tapes and, you know, of records and CDs and things like that. And, um, you know, so, some of those, some of that time as a kid was just those, those fun memories are kind of what brought me into radio and have kept me going, uh, through, through the years and whatnot. Uh, I first took, I first got into WGDR, um, uh, when I had a year off between high school and college, and then I eventually went to college and did college radio at Vermont Tech. And then when I left and moved back to central Vermont and, and lived in Plainfield for a while, I live in Montpelier now, I got back into the station and I've kind of been involved ever since. Uh, so it's just kind of the, the, the joy that, that keeps me going with it. Um, the, to talk about my show you know it's uh it's it's mostly been a music show like a lot of things it's it's evolved and changed and especially with covid that kind of threw things out of whack for everyone but um uh when i started it was just a music show where i played a lot of favorite music that i enjoyed and wanted to share with the world and i just played cds and records and tapes or whatever it was at the time and um as I grew and changed as a person, I became a, a interested in DJing and I was able to get DJ CD players and things like that. And I made some other friends in the Burlington area. And uh, I went from just kind of playing music on my show to uh, being able to have, you know, guests come down and make friends that were also DJs. Uh, mostly around the Burlington area, but really from, from wherever I had some other friends from Ohio who came out one time and there would be guests in the studio and I would invite them. Oh, why don't you come down sometime and we can work out a show. My, my show is on Saturday night. So it works well where typically other people aren't working or they can come down and check it out having an evening show. Um, and I would have guest DJs. So it wasn't always just me playing music. I was able to bring in other people and they could talk about, you know, could help promote other DJ shows that they were having in, in Burlington or even down at, in central Vermont at positive pie or wherever it may be. Uh, other original artists, if people had produced their own music, they could, uh, I, I tried to get them to come down and, um, you know, play a few of their productions on the, on the air with me and help give them a chance to, to help get some additional exposure for that. Uh, you know, COVID changed that. I, I, I work a tech job and I, I certainly can pre-record my show and, and have it set for automation, but I struggled with it. It's, it's always really just been a live thing for me. I kind of need that spur of the moment type of thing. Um, when I, when I play my show, I, I have some DJ style CD players where you can beat match and mix and uh, it's, it's kind of that, in the moment type of thing where you can kind of pick the next track right away that kind of helps keep it interesting and fun for me. Uh, I mean, that said, I still do need to do some prep work to find the songs that I want to play on my show. And a lot of that just comes from listening to other DJs. Uh, drum and bass is a sub genre of dance music. Dance music itself has lots of other sub genres, but, uh, I just I like the tempo and the the fast pace and it's not a comic thing it's it's rhythmically interesting uh you know growing up I started listening to 
I, I grew up in the 90s. I, I liked alternative rock. I still do, but I started to transition to electronic music because it started to sound much more interesting to me. And then drum and bass, just much more rhythmically interesting to me. I'm a, I'm a drummer, so I like to listen to it. So how do I prep for my show? I listen to lots of other drum and bass DJs throughout the week on other internet radio stations and um, I listen to other local radio as well too. Lots of radio just kind of keeps me going throughout the day. My headphones during work or whatnot. And I will listen to what they play or I will check their playlists. A lot of my music these days uh, comes from Shazam. You know, I'll use the phone app to try to catch what other DJs are playing. You know, if it's playing on my phone, I'll use the Shazam app to try to identify the song. And then I've got a record of it there. I have like 9,000 Shazams on my phone. And uh, as I prepare for my show to try to find the music to play, I'll import it into my DJ software that I use. Uh, there's a lot of different, different types of DJ software out there. I use Serato DJ. And there's some... Um, Look, I'm looking at my DJ gear over on the shelf. It's uh, it, it basically just lets you beat match and mix. And uh, I'll bring the songs into the software to to have it ready to play for for my show. And uh, that's about it. You know, it's 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 basically just it's all me lately. I haven't haven't really had guests. I mean, I certainly could pre-record something, but I I've changed too. Uh, I used to be out and about in Burlington and I would see friends of mine who DJ more often and I still kind of keep in touch with them, but I don't, I've also grown up and have a couple kids now. So uh, I still listen to plenty of music, but I don't have that uh, connection to, you know, really bring in other guest DJs as much as I usually, at least in my show where it's live, I, I certainly could try to pre-record, uh, you know, some other things like that, but I'm trying to do interviews or other pre-recorded mixes, which, I, I somewhat do. I do play some other pre-recorded mixes every once in a while from other DJs just to um, try to get some of that out there. But that's basically <laughs> basically what I do for my show is listen to other DJs to hear what they play, get song ideas, artist track IDs, and then find those selections, bring it into my DJ software, and then have it to play for uh, for my show. So... Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other specifics about it, but that's that's basically kind of how my show has evolved. It's like I said, I could pre-record, but I I still go into the station because it's it, it helps me. That's that's more of my style for how I can kind of do it best. I would say. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Nathan. Um, yeah, you're hearing a kind of, again, a mix, an intentional mix here of the different approaches to also music shows. Um, and there is something different about, there's there's pros and cons to doing it taped and doing it live. You know, there's that immediacy, that kind of like on feeling when you're doing live and there's a um, ability to fix the mistakes and be super planned and controlled when you're doing it taped. I did both. I mean, speaking of COVID, it was, you know, the, my home station at RUV totally shut down because nobody could go anywhere. And so I was one of the first in to teach RUV folks how to do remote shows, and it certainly is different. So, um, and there is always the option of, of also doing a hybrid show. So doing a little bit recorded, a little bit live to kind of have a toe in both spaces. And I've talked about that with a few of the new folks coming in. Uh, it's really handy, honestly, um, whether it's the winter or you're going on a vacation or something like that. Uh, and again, it feels different if you're going from one side to the other, but, um, but I encourage folks to kind of explore and think about those different styles in those different ways. And to Nathan's point too, um, we have ways for folks to plug in external gear. So if you if you are kind of drifting more into the actual uh, traditional DJ side of things and you're gonna be doing beat matching or you've got external gear, uh, you can always patch into the mixer that's um, through our um, dual record players we have in the studio. And I'm sure Nathan or I can um, happily give you some more tips on that or, or nerd out on DJ gear as well, which uh, yeah. So Nathan and I are also share the like, we don't really DJ anymore because we have kids, you know, and COVID, plus COVID, like, so it's the unofficial retirement of the, uh, the DJ crew here, but I digress. All right, our last panelist is Amy and she's calling in through the phone here. Um, Amy, I'm gonna go ahead and um, still pin you as a phone person here, um, but go ahead and take it away, please. 
Excellent. Yes, thank you, Lou. I am so excited to see this big team of new programmers. Uh, welcome aboard. This is just so beautiful. I, I love to see our community growing like this. Um, and I'm, I've been involved with GDR going way back. I'm actually a Goddard graduate. I graduated from Goddard College in 1994 with a community health degree. <laughs> um, and as I went about my work in community health all around uh, central Vermont, I knew I had to live within the listening range because I just love free format radio. I love free speech. I feel like it brings um, so much integrity and creativity to the airwaves and sharing the airwaves with the community and connecting with each other through the airwaves, sharing our voices with each other. It helps us build community and um, so I'm just a big fan of it. So I joined the Community Advisory Board for GDR way back in the day, and I spent, oh gosh, almost like 20 years, I think, just supporting programmers because I, I understood not even being one what a commitment it must be, you know, to, um, to say you're going to do your show every week and to gather the material and really put out the quality um, that people do and the heart that people do. I just so appreciated it, and I wanted to make sure programmers had whatever they need needed and that GDR had whatever it needed to keep going. Um, and so I also, uh, a few years ago, I guess, um, uh, maybe about eight years ago now or so, six years ago, I got my programmer's license. I went through the training. Um, I guess we don't get licenses anymore, but I went through the training, and I became a substitute. And because I'm a health teacher, um, I did a lot of substituting during the summer, and I would do shows during the summer. And because I'm a health teacher with children uh, of all ages, when the lockdown happened in 2020, I decided I needed to do a kids' show. You know, nothing on the airwaves was addressing the needs of kids, nothing at that point in the world seemed to be addressing the needs of kids. And so I started a kids' show, and it was a way for me to connect with kids, too, um, and, and still be there for them. Uh, and it's been a huge, wonderful, uplifting, amazing experience for me to put this show together every week. I've learned so much. Um, mostly the biggest lesson for me has been about breathing. I've learned a lot about my breath and my voice. I, I used to think I wouldn't be a very good programmer. I used to think because my voice wouldn't sound very good on the air. But after doing the show now for three years and listening every week to my show, I've learned it's really more about the tension in my throat <laughs> and how relaxed I am um, or how joyous I am, you know, how much integrity I really have, um, how much I'm really believing what I'm saying. That really changes the quality for me of my voice. Uh, I've also had to learn that, you know, it is really important to warm up uh, our voices, especially because my show's in the morning, so maybe that's more important for me because it's the, usually the first thing I'm saying to anybody is I'm on the air. <laughs> so I really, you know, take the time to do those theater exercises I learned back in the day, you know, to warm up my voice, warm up my body, do some stretching, um, really look at it like a performance thing, like theater. And I, I found that my show quality greatly improved once I was able to return to the station and do it live. Um, I really feel like that brings such an element for me. It just brings a better quality. And even though the ums and ahs are still there, I can't take them out of the recording. <laughs> and all of my mistakes and all of my flounder floundering, um, I like that. I, I think for me that just makes it uh, more real. So that works for me. Um, so I'd encourage people to try that. Also, you know, of course, paying attention to enunciating and pronunciating um, I, I do sometimes have a script, at least in the beginning I did have more scripts, um, catchphrases I wanted to make sure that I used and repeated, trying to really build a routine to the show. You know, it took a few years to really figure out what the structure uh, was going to be and, and to have the theme music at the beginning and the end. And, and every week I pick a theme, something that I'm curious and joyous about that I want to celebrate and I'm learning about, and then I bring that curiosity and what I've learned to the air, and uh, so that makes it really fun for me. So it's just I'm constantly learning new things. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to smile when you talk, <laughs> uh, if that's the theme of your show, if you're trying to uplift people at all. Uh, your emotions really come through, and I remember a programmer telling me that when I first started, and that, that made a big difference. And just the key things that, that everybody says, you know, slow down. You know, slow down. I know I've had to learn, and I'm still learning and struggling with just 
cutting back on the amount of information I'm trying to pack into a show or the amount of content and just focusing more intently and slowly, appreciating that it's auditory learning for folks and letting people really take the time to digest what you're saying or, or what the music is or the, you know, the feeling you're, you're putting out there. And then just mostly be yourself <laughs> because that integrity and creativity and who you are, that, that's what's, what brings it alive for the listeners. And I wanted to let people know that I am, um, I've been dubbed to be in charge of the Zoom recorders. So if people want to go out there and record people on the street the way John was talking about, Record those select board members, record those whoever, you know, you want to record out there. Um, the Zoom recorders are available, so let me know, and they're really easy to use. I was using them to record my roosters and things for my kids' show. Um, I want to do more of that background mute, background sounds, but also just recording people or meetings. They're just really fun. So let me know if you want more information about that. And just basically welcome aboard. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for so many uh, reminders to be yourself and ground yourself and that smile tip that somebody told me that years ago, and it's Amy's 100% right. There is a difference between you smiling on, when you turn that microphone on and you making any other emotion with your face. It, it, it lifts your spirit, uh, it lifts your voice, and, uh, and it really helps make that connection piece that so many have spoken to on tonight uh, about what the difference between radio and every other media is, is that we are intimate, we are the most intimate media source. People feel like you are just talking to them. And if you, when you're on the microphone, if, if the only thing you could think of is the one person out there who's listening and that's who you're talking to, that's that connection piece you're aiming for. Uh, not in a stressful kind of way, but just in a like, it's just you and me, it's just you and me. And we're here and we're gonna listen to some music or we're here and we're gonna talk about this thing. Uh, it really, um, it's a two way street about that intimacy. It's part of why I love radio so much. So panelists, I couldn't have scripted it better if we had, if we had scripted this. I mean, well done, everyone. You brought some great angles to all of the different ways to approach this. And this is just a tip of the iceberg, everybody. Everyone does a show in such a unique and different way, and so will all of you. These, tonight was just about kind of giving you, planting some spring seeds about things to think about as we go through here. So we're at the halfway point here, as I did last time. Get your wiggles out here. Feel free to stand up and stretch out. Um, and we're gonna open it up to some questions for our panelists here for a few minutes um, before we switch into the second half where we're gonna do some breakout groups and you get to decide if you wanna go into the music group or into the talk groups. So, and I'll explain that in a second, but I wanted to open it up to some questions. The easiest way to do this is one of two ways. You put your little emoji hand up in, in Zoom here and I can call on you, or you can put a question in the chat. Uh, and like I said, we'll take a few minutes here to, um, to ask some questions of the panelists. And I also just want to say, while, while people are thinking about questions, and it's okay if we have no questions, we can keep moving on too. While questions are percolating here, um, we actually do have a couple of other current programmers who snuck into the room tonight because they were so excited to hear the pan the fel their fellow programmers speak uh, and to hear more of the art of radio. So uh, in your small groups, you'll meet some of these folks too. Uh, but yeah, they're waving here, turning their, mic their uh, uh, screens on here. There's Rick and we've got Peter over there. Uh, so in case you're wondering who some of these folks are, these are, again, some of these longtime voices that you've heard on the station. So, hey, Damien, I see your little emoji hand. Go for it. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you for, um, for that presentation. That was incredible. I, um, I'm wondering about um, playing music um, in foreign languages that we don't understand and possibly violating um, a regulation. And then I also was curious to know how Nathan would find his selections after he shazammed, like the process of actually acquiring the music. Um, I know that we have a database that we can look into. Um, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions, but I won't ask them all right now, but cheers, thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Uh, we can also uh, liven up the chat too. So if you've got more questions, put them in the chat. And as we go through tonight, uh, panelists can feel free to also answer back via the chat so we can kind of dual purpose here. Nathan, I'll take the FCC question first since I'm the Watt Watt station manager here. Um, you know, technically we are bound, no matter the language, uh, for those FCC violations. So again, remember it's 
indecency, its obscenity, and um, it's, um, you know, essentially those seven swear words. Now, I do not pretend to know those seven swear words in every language that is on the planet Earth. However, most recorded music um, has some indication of explicit or not, um, and especially in this digital age at this point. And, and before the end of tonight, I'm going to revisit the conversation about streaming platforms and uh, fair use when it comes to copyright. So, um, so I'll come back to this in a second. But, you know, for the most part, um, if you're, for example, streaming something off of Spotify, you can check down something on Spotify or, or Tidal or some of these other streaming services, and you can see kind of what, um, uh, what material has explicit content in it. Um, if you come physically to the station, there have been years of very meticulous reviewing of our physical library that actually tells you um, what, what is FCC okay and what isn't. I mean, I actually remember back in the day, in the 90s, as you all know, I started my show at GDR, reviewing some CDs and writing on them. There's like people's handwriting actually in there that says, I reviewed this CD and don't play number one, number five, number six, because it's FCC violations. And so there's some indicators like that throughout um, kind of our actual library. And again, when you're out there kind of searching stuff, that's the best way I can kind of definitively say to avoid that kind of content. But again, usually FCC violations, no matter the language, when it comes to um, uh, records that are coming to us from promotion from labels, they, they don't want us getting in trouble either. They don't want you to like never play that album because you got slammed on an FCC violation. But um, there's no foolproof way for the obscenity stuff. So the sexually like explicit stuff and things like that. So, you know, for the most part, I recommend that you do a little bit of like a double searching if you're going to play stuff that's out of a language that you don't actually speak or understand. Um, for the most part, not to totally throw a genre under the bus, but really it's like rap and hip hop are the most notorious for having um, a lot of explicit content and things like that pretty much in every language. I mean, it's kind of the like shtick of that those two genres. Not to say that other genres don't have swears, but you know, if you're looking for multiple potential FCC violations in a song versus um, just a few, that's kind of what I would say. There's no, there's no easy answer to that one. And that's my best way to kind of stumble through it. Um, Nathan, I'm going to toss it to you for how you go scouring for scouring. I can't say the word. You know what I'm saying? The old school crate digging. So in the in the realm or spirit or whatever you want to call it, of couldn't have scripted it better. Um, the, streaming. Uh, there's there's two ways that I kind of get into my show. So like I said, I listen to a lot of other DJs to get to hear what other people play, or or maybe I'll. I'll check the the charts. There's a website called Beatport where you can buy dance music and maybe I'll look at the charts that they list on there, that type of thing. Um, my music is either purchased where I buy the tracks from different online digital stores, whether iTunes, Beatport, or any store you want to use. Um, They're sourced that way. More recently, I have used the title streaming integration with my software to be able to stream and mix tracks with my software for playing them on the air. Now this gets tricky, uh, I suppose, in how there's the terms and conditions you sign and whatnot when you sign up for Spotify or whatever it is. There is a, it's a bit of a gray area, I think to use Lou's explanation from previous emails and whatnot. Uh, I, I, you know, we don't think, hope that we wouldn't be uh, scolded or, or fined for such a, a thing, but music is meant to be played, but there's other rights around it and whatnot. So to, to, to bring it back to the question, if I can try to best answer it, you know, if I, if I find some songs I want to play more and more lately, what I'm doing is I, I have a title subscription and it, it works with the DJ software that I use. I will search for the song and it's all like spur of the moment, like right as I'm playing it on the air, which is why the internet connection is kind of an important thing for me. Uh, having the wired connection has also helped. We, there's a wireless connection, but I also use the wired connection, which Lewis put back in the studio. So thank you for that. Uh, anyway, I'll stream the song right to my software and have it be available to play that way. And I can mix it and change the tempo and everything right there to, to play and stream it. Uh, but I, th I think... The only other point I would say about that is that maybe if you, if you don't advertise, so to say, we don't advertise. We if you if you don't say, oh, that track was by so and so, I streamed it from Title or I played it from YouTube or whatnot. I think that's kind of the best, most most graceful way to handle 
the tricky situation of um, using streaming services for playing music on the air. And uh, I'll, I'll let Lou maybe kind of close out with that thought. I mean, quite literally what Nathan said, uh, I was talking a lot with the board um, since our last session where we kind of, you know, the policy of the station, let me station manager hat on right now, the policy of the station, it is our duty to tell you that you, you click off on terms and conditions that you will not rebroadcast content from YouTube, from Spotify, from Tidal, from any of these streaming services. Rebroadcasting is radio. However, we live in a digital age where as a station, we already play the subscription, pay into the subscription services of all of that recorded music that you would find in those places, nearly all of it. And frankly, the self-independent artists that are out there are aching for us to do this anyway. That's like old school radio. Like you send your CD to CD. Does anybody know what a CD is? Should I check down the, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, you send your CD in, you hope the station plays it, and that's how people got stuff on the air. So in this, these conversations that we've been having, uh, it's kind of exactly what Nathan said. Um, it would be very hard for anybody listening to um, prove that you're playing it off of a streaming service unless you said, I played that off my streaming service. Thanks, Spotify. So station manager hat off. We, are, uh, we want you to access music. We are allowed to play that music. The actual streaming source is just a risk that you take if that were ever to be found. And it's not a legal thing. This is not the same thing as copyright. I want to be really clear. And later on, I'll talk a little bit more about fair use. But it's essentially the worst that can happen is that Spotify, who does not have people policing this, would have to find you, prove that you violated the terms and conditions, and you would lose your account. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's nearly impossible to happen. But again, station manager hat on. It's my duty to inform you that you signed off on terms and conditions about not rebroadcasting. I will leave it in the muddy season gray area there for that. Um, I want to quickly answer two other questions that have come in through here. And we might may or may not get to all these and we might just kind of need to answer these over listservs and other means. I want to make sure we keep moving with the tonight here. But um, we have a phone in the studio. Yes. And you can take calls on the air. We actually didn't actually get much into that tonight. Um, we have a video that a very short video that shows you how to use it. You'll see how to use it when you um, meet up with people live in the studio. It's a pretty simple process once you learn it. And my answer to the question here is, uh, can you have people call in? The answer is yes. I 100% with my station manager hat permanently on highly encourage you to always screen the call before you put them on the air. Some programmers differ, uh, differ with me on this, but there is no way, able to, way to control what someone's going to say um, or who that might be. I mean, heck, it could be a telemarketer. I mean, you know, we have internet phones. This is like the way the world we live in now. So I'm a big fan of screening it and also consent. Um, you, we live in a world where people really need to have, you know, you need to ask permission and make sure they're ready to go on the air. Of course, then you put them on the air and they go off the rails. One of two things that you can do, hang up on them. It's a freeing experience. Just boom, they're gone. And sorry about that, listeners. We also have a dump button. The dump button is a nice little red button that's going to be very tempting to push all the time. It kills it for about 10 seconds. So if somebody goes off the rails, you need to get it off the, off the air. That's what the dump button is for. But the key thing I want to emphasize is that the dump button needs to essentially recharge. I will not go into the technology of this. So I don't encourage people to sit there and try to keep hitting the dump button uh, if there is like FCC content on a song or something like that. That's not what it's intended for. It's meant as the like panic button quite literally to clear the air and get that person off. Because I can guarantee if they've said something wrong once, they're going to say it again. So your duty as a programmer is to keep the station compliant and again, show due diligence. Due diligence is hanging up on someone sometimes and moving on. So that's how I'll answer that one real, uh, hopefully really quickly here. Um, and then the, the question here about um, texting and comments. So we actually do have, have something through our website uh, where people can chat the DJ. It hasn't been used very much, and I think it's mostly because um, some of our current programmers are just so used to doing shows the way they do it. Um, but it's called um, TDO, and it's basically a thing you log into right on the PC in the studio, and people can chat the DJ, and you can chat them right back. It's kind of like AOL-ish. If no one is on in the air, uh, on the air, it becomes an email and it comes to me and then I usually forward it on if it's appropriate to the programmer and you can kind of connect if you want to with that listener that way. Um, I'm going to read a couple of these other comments while Stephen is asking his next question and we'll do this for about another two or three minutes or so and then we're going to move on to the next piece. So go for it, Stephen. Uh, thank you. Um, my question is for Mr. Dillon. Um, if I uh, heard you correctly, you said something that you like to report on things that folks want to know about. And I'd like to know how you go about learning what folks want to know. Um, do you, uh, man on the street style, go down and 
chat folks up to you, chat to the next person in the grocery line. Is there some uh, online service that says what's on the, the 10 top items that's on everybody's mind in Washington County or in the state of Vermont? And I'll shut up now and listen to your answer. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, uh, I didn't do public opinion surveys to generate my stories. Um, I would hear about things. I would uh, follow my own nose. I, um, you know, I, it's, it's, I would hear about it from friends or um, I'd look in the courts. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, that's where the judgment comes in, I guess. I, I now um, Vermont Public, for example, as you know, they they do a show called um, Brave Little State, where it's listener driven. My what I did was um, following beats. So if I was following the environmental beat, and somebody got if I saw water quality violations, I'd write about that because I kind of assumed people would want to know that. Lake Champlain water quality was exceeding its limits for the past however many years. Um, that the toxic algae blooms there were going to hurt you. And that's what you might want to know about. So um, it was very much my own judgment, I have to say. Maybe I, I misspoke when I said what folks want to know about. Maybe it was more what I wanted to know about. And I thought folks might want to know that too. Thank you. Great. Thanks, John. Um, our wonderful panelists have answered your questions in the chat. So as folks have had them, um, feel free to take a look in the, uh, the chat for those um, various pieces of um, a couple of great questions, actually, that might be a little bit more universal as well. Um, are there any other, we'll take like one more live question if anybody has it. Um, yeah, go for it, Rick. I want to jump in on Stephen's comment and say to anyone interested in journalism, there's a really great news uh, news engagement education site called trustingnews.org. It was started by some women at the University of Florida and the University of Missouri at the journalism school, and it has all kinds of free education on how community radio and community journalism can connect with audiences. There's engagement strategies for Twitter and social media. There's how to do surveys weekly. There's how to use your email to say, hey, what's going on in the community that we need to report about? What, what, what stories are we missing? So there's all kinds of really great resources there and it's all free and open to the public. I've engaged with them many times. I've connected Carl up with them. I think anybody who's in, interested in that kind of engagement, there's evolving a whole a whole field of news engagement as as Google and and uh, and other large companies have eaten print's lunch. Print and radio have really worked hard to earn trust back and do the kind of engagement that uh, people want to do humanly instead of algorithmically. So there's a whole new group of journalists who are studying engagement and communication and it's cool stuff. I'll put uh, the link in uh, the chat. Thanks. Joseph, before you, and thanks, Rick. Um, I see Stephanie's hand up first, so hang on, Joseph. We'll kick it to Stephanie for a second. Hi. Sorry, Joseph. Thank you, everyone, for being here and sharing these jewels of wisdom, radio wisdom with us. So my question is, am I able to set up a camera in the studio and have people come in in person? And then what types of rules are there or where can I um, learn more about rules about if I'm doing the radio show, am I also allowed to use that content and publish it on something like YouTube or a podcast or a different social media platform after the fact? Great question. Um, so I'll take that one, everybody, if that's all right. Uh, you can record within the state, the studio, 
however you wish. So the audio of your show, in fact, we encourage folks to record through an Audacity program that is on the PC in there, your show straight up. Uh, we do also push out our archives and keep uh, copies of our archives. There's two versions of that. So for two weeks, your show will be available publicly through our website, which you all probably at this point know, you can listen back on demand as you wish. It's only available for two weeks because that's the legal limit uh, for online streaming there. Um, internally, we do keep our archives longer. So if something comes up and we need to double check the tape, so to speak, uh, that's how we do it. So just know you are always recorded and we hold on to it. So just because you, it's been two weeks, you think you got away with something, not necessarily. So, you know, it's okay to make mistakes, but the goal here is to tighten it up and stay within the bounds. Um, you know, video is possible. I've been part of a number of stations that, that even do a live cam. I'm always a little confused by that because radio is inherently meant to be not visual, but you know, you do you. Um, but finally, the content that you create. So your show, you can go forth and um, put that in a couple of further ways publicly if you want. I would not recommend that you do it on YouTube because you will be slapped down with copyright infringement and it won't be even worth putting the content up there and they'll probably shut your account down. That's the same for the, um, the service called SoundCloud. SoundCloud lives in Germany, just so you know, and they have much stricter copyright rules than the US. If you think the US is bad, try going to Germany for that. So again, you will lose your archive catalog eventually if they don't do it pretty soon. They've, and they've got crawlers that, that listen for this stuff, you know, and there's certain artists that uh, almost always will pull up a copyright infringement. The site I recommend to folks is called mixcloud.com. Uh, it is specifically designed for DJ sets, like Nathan's describing and even radio shows. It was free up until literally December, y'all, which is kind of like, ah, of course they want you to subscribe in, but I get it, you know, you gotta make your money at some point here. So they let you put up 10 shows for free. And after that, you pay in like a monthly subscription if you really wanna build your catalog out from there. That's where I personally have put all of mine after I my cautionary tale where I lost all of mine for about 15 years. I used SoundCloud and then they took it away. It was no warning, they just took it away. and copyright infringement, you know, so couldn't fight the man on that one. Um, so I've used Mixcloud for about five or six years. I actually switched to the free account because I'm just like, at this point, it's not worth me, you know, paying in for people to listen back. But um, but that is a site that pays in to these streaming services to allow for um, you to have your archive up there. So Mixcloud.com is what that one's called. Hopefully, I think I answered all those questions there. Um, as a point of order, for, as a facilitator here, I think it makes sense for us to answer a few more questions because I think people are picking up some useful stuff here. We're going to um, save the um, talking with each other piece to our next programmer meeting because I think actually it'll be really useful to have it be a shared new folks and old folks together. I'm, I'm changing this up on the fly, y'all. Um, so we still will get a chance to kind of do that, that show sharing together, but, um, but I'm going to take a couple more questions and then I'm going to um, still keep us on time to wrap at eight. But the house, couple of housekeeping things I still need to get to are, are critical enough for, uh, for me to kind of punt that section to a future meeting. So just so you know where we are and where we're going here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to throw it to, to uh, excuse me, Joseph, I did not forget you. I saw your real hand up there, not your yellow emoji hand. So go for it. Yeah, well, thank you. But before I uh, say what I wanted to say, I think Damien has asked an important question about is there a forum or, or a place to stay in touch with each other and ask questions to our radio community. And I would ask you to respond to that, Lou, because I think that's an important question going forward. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> first, I will say I misspelled mixed cloud. Cloud has a C in it, in case you didn't know that. So go ahead and check that in the chat. Um, we have I mean, a program. Mix, mix loud. You might be onto something mix there with mix loud. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and copyright that so you can't take it. Um, <clears throat> I've said it and it's recorded. I'm just kidding. Maybe we'll make some money together. Um, so the answer to that is uh, our listserv, our programmer listserv. Um, it is intentionally designed as a two-way street. And as I mentioned in our first training, I ask that folks re remember that with respect and don't overload each other's inboxes. Um, and usually what I would say with good listserv um, etiquette for questions is that you kick the question out there and you ask folks to e email you individually, unless it's a question where the answer would be good for the good of the order. So oftentimes somebody will ask me a question, uh, you know, individually and I'll think, oh, I should probably just put this out to the whole listserv. Like, like we have a broken studio chair, for example, and people have been asking, are we just going to repair that one or are we going to get a new one? And I'm like, I don't like to roll the dice, if you will, with, uh, with broken chairs because we have liability insurance that I know how much it costs. So I'm going to get us one that actually is uh, the factory has put the wheels in and not me or someone like Joseph. No offense, jo Joseph, but um, but, you know, everybody should know that, you know, it doesn't need to just be a one on one thing. So you should feel free to use that listserv to ask these questions. 
all of these current programmers are so excited to meet you all. So don't feel sheepish about using listserv, but do um, please, if you've got a very specific question, ask me, ask some of the panelists, you've got all of our contact info. We're all more than willing and, and happy to answer, you know, as obscure a question as possible. But if it seems like a question that a lot of people would have, go ahead and use that listserv. Um, okay, and I think so. There... I think I think you were referring to the fact that I have often said that for me, high tech is a pencil. So yes, I I wouldn't sit in a chair that I put the wheels on myself. Exactly. Now I just wanted to say something about the issue of journalism. Um, John Dillon is a journalist. I don't consider myself a journalist, and my show is not intended to be a journalist show. Uh, it has a point of view. It's very clear about that point of view. My guests are invited to be on the show because they share to some degree, not necessarily entirely and maybe not even fully uh, majority wise, but to some degree, they, they also have a point of view that I think it's important for people to hear. So I just want to point that out, that I don't consider my show a journalist show. I don't feel I have to bring balance, quote unquote, into the show, although I do in my questions sometimes will challenge a uh, person who is expressing a point of view, trying to give an alternative point of view on. But it's it's not a journalist show. It's not a news show. It is an advocacy show, advocacy for justice and peace. And people who tune it in eventually will get that if they don't get it right away. Thank you, Joseph. All right, Stephen, I think I'm going to give you the last word. And again, if folks have additional, I know you all have a lot of questions. So feel <clears> free <throat> to fill my inbox. That's what I'm paid for, is to just send emails all day, it seems, seems like sometimes. Um, but again, feel free to ask your fellow new community of programmers. We are all, we all want you to be successful and there's no silly question. There really isn't. Um, Stephen, go for it. Yeah, this is a follow up on what Stephanie asked earlier. And I just want to make sure I understood your answer correctly. If I understood her question correctly, what Stephanie was asking was she can bring a video camera into the studio and record her own program, which is her original content and then asked if that could be subsequently posted, for example, on YouTube. And you said, no, they'll take it down because of copyright infringement. And my question is, how is that so when it's her original content that she's posting? It's not because I'm guessing, unless, sorry, let me, I made the assumption that there would be music playing. So if Stephanie is uh, doing her own spoken word of her own poetry or just doing a whole talk show, that's just, there's no other content in there. And actually, I'm going to get to this a little bit when I talk about fair use, but I was making an assumption of a music show there um, or that there was music involved in it. If there's any recorded music involved, um, that's where cop the copyright trolls will find you and, uh, and have that impact. If it's a show that is purely of your own creation, your, your concepts, your ideas, your, con your content, you're not playing snippets really from anything else, then you could, I guess, put it up on YouTube in that way. Um, but it's again, it's like you're rolling the dice if you know uh, a little bit because uh, YouTube also just they also have some content that um, filters that perplex me sometimes you know this Stephen it, it pulled down one of our our very boring dry robot trainings uh, where it was it for some reason <laughs> thought it you know kids shouldn't be watching it I agreed kids should not be watching it but they thought it for other reasons and I couldn't even defend I couldn't even get through the um, appeal process uh, with them so I don't I personally don't think YouTube is a great place to put content unless it is purely only yours. And I mean that carte blanche, you know, not just in the concept of, of radio stations. So uh, and again, we can kind of nerd out in the world of YouTube some other time. But that's how I'd answer that one. OK, thank you. Yeah. All right, folks. Great questions. Great panelists. Thank you all so much. I've got a couple of um, housekeeping things. Bill, you have a quick thing while I'm pulling up the slides. Go for it. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> He's like, no, leave me alone. Um, okay, so let me see here. Oh, wrong screen. Hang on. Okay, so um, I kind of live created, this is the magic of the facilitator behind the scenes. I live summed up um, our beautiful panelists here with some of their main points um, that you heard tonight. And uh, again, I really want to thank all of them for um, thoughtfully preparing for their sections of the panel and um, bringing kind of 
you know, the best of the goods, as we so say uh, in the biz to, um, to what they were sharing tonight. So just some things to think about as you start to think about your shows, you know, finding your voice, the power of having guests on the shows, um, you know, your process, what is that going to be about? Your show's why, um, you know, it can really help ground and prepare you for, for being successful. And there's no such thing as perfection. It is part of, you know, the white supremacy culture. So, you know, the beauty of community radio is that a little dead air, a little bit of changing it up, a little bit of experimentation is what this is all about. So, um, so really, we encourage you to aim for that. There's never dead air. So the next piece here, um, I Oops. wanted to, we're going to skip this one again here for connecting over shows. We'll do this at the next program meeting or maybe the one in May here. So, um, you know, I know folks might have been excited about that, but we're not forgetting it. We're just going to punt it to a future one. Um, you know, it was mentioned a little bit, but it, I cannot, for the, uh, the radio nerd in me, the radio lover in me, cannot uh, do an Art of Radio workshop without making sure that we remember audience. I mentioned it briefly at the start here, and of course we're making content that we want people to listen to, but I, I just have some, some kind of leading questions I want po folks to think about, and I'll send these slides so you can also use this as a, another prompt to be thinking about with your show, but the whole reason we do this is to hope that somebody's out there listening and that we're changing someone's day or perspective of thinking or just general experience of their day uh, in some sort of way because of our show and because of the content we're putting out there. Um, you know, you can make a radio show at, at your home by yourself with no listeners. Um, the point of this is different. We want people to be engaging. We want people to think about it. So just want you to be, kind of think about, you know, the, the audience experience. For you, what would make good radio? What does good radio sound like? It's one of those great things about you know it when you hear it. Uh, so think about that, that sound experience that you're creating for people with that audience there. I've mentioned it a few times, I've alluded to it. Uh, Nathan totally set me up with a great um, softball earlier to kind of lead into this, but I wanted to clarify that streaming piece and the copyright uh, component. I think I already clarified the streaming piece. Uh, again, think of mud season with my station manager hat on and then the station manager hat off about how to, to work the streaming uh, software. Um, I wanna clarify copyright. Um, in that first training we did last week, we were rumbling through the rules, copyrights, DMCA, it was a lot to undertake. Uh, I fear that I um, scared people that, you know, copyright means you have to ask everybody for every single thing that you might potentially be playing on the air if it isn't a music label. That's actually not the case. There is a concept called fair use. So the difference between copyright as in you need to ask for full permission is if I'm going to play something in full, so someone's entire TED talk, uh, someone's lecture, um, I'm going to read someone's entire poem. It is very important, not only in good practice and etiquette, but it's important for copyright that you get written permission to do so. For the most part, for those examples I'm giving, maybe not so much TED Talks, um, people will say yes. Uh, and then you can play it in full and you can kind of do the intro and the outro and cite it and kind of give some context for your show. Um, but where that strays from, and if you don't get that, that stuff, you cannot do that. You cannot just straight up play a lecture. You cannot just straight up you know, play an Oprah interview with somebody. You can't do that we move the pendulum over towards fair use and fair use is a very blur talk about mud season man it's like mud season in cabot trying to get up the back roads fair use gets really ugly really quickly if you talk to five lawyers they're all going to give you a different response to this but the basic concept of fair use that i try to encourage people to think about is approaching it thinking about news education and the artistic experience of the content you're creating so if it's going to um, further the um, sharing of news or the further education of the piece that you're doing or the show that you're doing, I mean, or the artistic experience of the show that you're doing, that fits within fair use. As long as it's something like that's a clip, like a snippet, so about you know three to five minutes is generally what I encourage people to think about, and you're creating something bigger than that piece. So a great example of this is I'm going to do a talk show about climate change. I'm going to play a three minute piece from Bill McKibben talking about, you know, how we're all going to literally burn uh, if we don't do something right now. And then I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring, you know, uh, you know, Peter on the show with me and we're going to talk about climate change and how we're seeing it happening right here in Vermont and give some examples of it. We might play another clip uh, of folks uh, who are de climate you know, deniers or something, but it's part of this larger educational conversation we're having as part of the show. It isn't just Bill McKibben talking. I'm not just straight up playing his interview. So that's one example of how you would use that in fair use there. Um, and again, the whole, the whole show needs to stand alone in its own creative um, component. Uh, the other way I'll give an example here is that fair use is often used 
um, in um, you know academic settings, right? So if you're like citing your source, right, in the paper you're writing or even the book you're writing, uh, that is totally fair use. So the key here to remember is that you want to cite the source, keep it short, and make sure that this is part one piece of a larger piece of your show um, that is much different than just that content of the piece you're sharing. And I'm happy to explain that in more detail with anybody who's going to be dabbling in this, but it's totally cool to do. We actually have a couple shows that do this in a creative way beyond kind of your traditional way of thinking an educational piece that's just talk show. Um, so I encourage you to think of, to listen into um, uh, uh, Dave Furland's show, which is called uh, Trailing Edge, um, which is on Tuesdays, I believe. He infuses music with like little snippets and clips and like, you know, soundscaping stuff and uh, and then always cites it at the end. He kind of does a talk back at the end of that hour show to uh, to bring it all together. One other quick thing I want to do housekeeping wise, uh, we're about to do something huge, big and different for GDR. It is something the people have been hammering for or hankering for uh, because we have been stuck in a schedule that is literally Groundhog's Day rerunning content because of COVID. Uh, and we also, you know, did a little thing called a station tra uh, ownership transition in the middle of that. No big deal. Um, and so us changing the schedule with all of your new shows is exciting and big and people sometimes struggle with change. And so I just wanted to prepare people, especially live shows, that we have a dedicated listener base that is going to share their opinions with us. 95% of this is going to come to me through emails and I will share with you the stuff that isn't off the wall. Um, or isn't, you know, to, is, is something to do with. And most of it's going to be like, thank you so much. We're so excited for the new shows. It's exciting to hear you. Every once in a while, I just want to prepare people. You will get a caller if you're doing a live show who might disagree with what you're doing on the air or might say that they don't like your show. And that is their opinion. And thank you so much for listening. Do not take this to heart, my dear radio making friends. This disapproval matrix is something I keep on my wall here in my office. It's done by the wonderful Ann Friedman, who's a, um, a writer and a speaker and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I just want to remind you that um, the people who are in the haters corner try to steal the microphone the most because we live in a culture that is all about trying to cancel and it's all about trying to shut down and it's all about yelling at this point. The people who live in the lovers corner just love you and they don't actually remember that they got to tell you that sometimes. So for every one hater, there's at least 10 lovers out there. And so if you're picking up the phones, don't be afraid of this, but just know that if you ever do get some negative feedback, there's 10 more of them out there that are like, I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for jumping on the air with us. So just wanted to share that out there with you. And again, most of, I am the main filter here for feedback to the station. And I really only share the stuff that is gonna help you propel your show. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention, and, and then this will be nearly it here for tonight, is uh, a couple of folks joined us at our program meeting this week and we started talking about the April on air drive. It is our first on air fundraiser for the year and some of you are going to be starting your shows during that. So I just wanted to give some quick context in case you have no idea what a drive is. Um, if you listen to public radio, you actually probably do know what a drive is. It is live on air pitching, asking people to support the station through donations uh, to keep the programming going. It's really nothing more fancy than that. And usually pitching is done through a combination of using talking points or little mini scripts, or frankly, and I encourage this mostly, speaking from the heart. Speak to what you know, what you love about the station, why you are excited to be doing your show, and then asking that people support keeping your show going by supporting the station they're listening to right now and going to WGDR.org and donating. So we're gonna be talking about the drive a lot more with some more details over the listserv and at the programmer meeting that's coming up in April. But some of you will be starting your show during those last two weeks of April and uh, the drive will be part of it. Pitching basically is once an hour. And again, we're gonna be having talking points for this and you really don't do anything more than that. You just kind of, it's part of, it's like, it's like talking back, these are the five songs you just heard. And hey, remember we're in the middle of our spring, you know, on air drive and you read the little script and then you move on. Um, some people can get really nervous about this because technically you're asking for money, but technically you're asking to support the station actually. And you're asking people to support literally what you're getting to do right now. And I can't think of anything better to do um, as part of some of your new shows than to jump right in and help us be successful. So if you have more questions about drives, I'm always happy to, again, talk about any topics um, offline and in a different way, but I just wanted you to know a little bit about um, what the drive is about. Um, and we have a collective goal to raise $10,000 over those two weeks. Um, last fall, our last fall drive, we raised over $8,000. So, you know, we, we raise a little bit more each time. And the reason we increased it, the board and I hemmed and hot about this, but uh, we've got a bunch of new live shows coming on. And so we're going to have more live people and a more reason for people to be wanting to give to the station to support us. So 
Um, so I hope that folks are um, feel enthused about that and not intimidated. And I'm here to make sure that you move from intimidated category to heck yeah, let's do this category. So on any topic. So uh, let me be your buddy in that if you've got any questions. All right, y'all. We are at the end of the second training as part of training uh, for getting your show. There's one more step to this big process. This is that fork in the road I was talking about at the beginning of the, of the training tonight. Some of you fine folks will be going into making remote shows and you'll be joining me and Dave Ferlin next Thursday to teach you this Audacity program, which, spoiler alert, you can, you can pregame and look on the internet and see what this looks like. There are a ton of YouTube videos about how to use it. That'll be handy after you actually go through this session training. But Dave Ferlin taught all of our current programmers how to do this in the depth of COVID. So, uh, so next week will actually be a pretty handy workshop for remote programmers, but all of you are invited. So if you want to learn how to dabble in this, you know, making promos or, um, or shows from home, you are invited to come next week. We're also going to record it. Um, if you're live, you're not required to come. So you can always just watch it some other time later on too. So you can lessen your load in that way. Live folks, a lot of us are so excited to meet you in person uh, in the studio. Uh, where you've signed up for the live shadow training piece. You've all gotten that link. I can send it out again if folks are looking for it. Um, but the expectation is that if you've never done radio before, we ask that you sign up for at least two slots. And if you've done radio before, that you sign up for at least one to kind of knock the dust off. Uh, and you can always sign up for more if after you've done the first one, you're like, oh my God, I got to do that again. That's totally fine. We're kind of trying to do this flexibly for the next three weeks, basically. Some of the fine folks who are on the, uh, the training tonight are some of those shadow people as well. Um, the last couple things to know is that uh, for homework, uh, please finish reading through the station manual. There will technically be a quiz at the end of this. It's going to be 10 questions. It's mostly going to be the greatest hits. Like, you know, uh, I'm not going to be testing you in the minutia of what is copyright. I will be testing you to make sure that you know that you can't play swears on the air, right? Uh, it's going to be a pretty fair quiz. And if you are a someone who does not do well with quizzes, let me know. That's an easy thing to accommodate for you and I can have a conversation instead. Um, I'm going to be sending out a quick um, PDF that is a little check sheet to make sure you don't forget to do any of these steps here. There's a few other things that are going to be in that um, that list that you'll see that are things like, um, you know, share a, a, a photo of you of yourself so we can put it on our website, write a little bio so we can put it on the Spinatron page so people can know a little bit about you and what your show is going to be about. So it's got a short little punch list of things to do. It includes also the need to sign the programmer MOU, which is in our, um, our station manual. So I'll help make sure that you accomplish all those things, but I'm going to give you kind of that punch list so to make sure that you do that successfully. And then finally, as you feel ready, you check down with me after all this like final process of shadowing or record this remote recording process, and you let me know when you're like, all right, I'm ready to take the leap. Let's do this, Lou, and we will work you into the slow rollout of the new schedule. As I said at the beginning of training, we're not just starting it all as of May 1st or anything. We want people to kind of start as you feel ready. So we're here to, um, to support you in that process and get you uh, onto the schedule um, as you're ready there. So that said, I believe, and here's that homework checklist, by the way. Again, I'll send it to you as a PDF. It's got, there's no, there's no gotchas on here. It's everything that you've heard uh, us talk about um, throughout the training thus far. And again, I'll send that as a PDF tomorrow with the link to tonight's uh, recorded, um, recorded piece. All right, that is the triumphant end of the always fabulous slideshow, the wonderful panel that you've heard tonight. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left and uh, one of two things can happen. One is that you could totally ghost. You have more than uh, fulfilled your time here tonight and you can sign off of the Zoom. If you've got outstanding questions that you still want to um, ask uh, or hang out until eight, um, I'm definitely committed to staying here that long, and I'm happy to ask, uh, answer any of these obscure questions you've been sitting on that you just can't possibly wait any longer to get answered. Uh, that, of course, assumes I know how to answer it, too. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I'll leave it open to folks. And again, I just want to thank our panelists again for the time tonight and your uh, expertise uh, in sharing with the new folks. So yeah, open it up to questions either in the chat or in the, um, uh, in the little emoji handy things. Thank you, Lou. I have another meeting at eight o'clock, so I'm getting off now. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to hearing your shows and welcome to WGD. Thank you, Joseph. Hey, I, you did mention something about finding your own voice. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'd like to talk about. How long did it take you to find your voice? Are you asking me that question, Peter? Yes, I was, oh, Lou. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fun fact, I'm also a programmer. You know, Peter, that's a great question because 
if you had asked 13 year old me, I would have said, I have no idea what I'm doing or who I am or how I'm showing up on the microphone. My goal was to just play music and not have any dead air. And it emerged from there, uh, honestly, Peter. And I would say that I really started finding my voice um, after a, a couple of years, honestly. A couple uh, of years. A couple that's of years. Exactly, that's exactly my, my experience. It, it took me a couple of years to find my voice. That's one thing. There's another thing. Um, people can get a feel for the board. You get a feel for the equipment. It's not just um, which knobs you turn up and down, but you kind of intuitively know what other people are doing with the board. You can kind of feel it from a distance. And that takes a good bit of experience. And one way to get it is to volunteer to fill in shows of people who have had shows there and, and, and have to be away. Maybe they're sick, maybe they're on vacation. Um, if you take the opportunity to fill in, you get a whole lot more experience. And for those of you, some people will love it like we do. And some people will last a few years and, and then realize it's not their bag. But there are those among you who will really take this to heart and really love radio, community radio. And those are the ones who will get the feel of the board. And you can phone in and tell the programmer what they're doing wrong sometimes. All right, I'll get off now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. We're, we are also each other's best assets for helping out in the moment. Um, as you all know, I work pretty much full time now for the station, which I'm very grateful for. But there's, I don't sit here and listen to the station all the time. Uh, as current programmers know, I, I listen back often. I try to dabble and I, in everybody's show at some point so I can kind of keep a tune but your fellow programmers will be tuned in and if you get into a moment we will know because of listening oh crap they left their mic on or oh crap they're having they're clearly having technical difficulties so don't be surprised if some of us call in and offer you you know some help uh, you know a lifeline of like hey talk to me tell me what, what's not working i can try to help you over the phone and if you really get into a jam and no one's calling in to help or doesn't get uh you know the vibe you also can always call me um, especially if there's something clearly that is actually broken um, and that sometimes happens. As Peter was just saying, we are community radio. We don't have brand new gear. Sometimes stuff gets funky. Sometimes stuff doesn't work as it should. Um, I do ask generally for programmers, um, especially if it's not kind of during normal business hours, if you will, um, to really do the, the, the over or under. Could this be an email that's just, hey, heads up, Lou, CD number one is broken, or is it, oh no, Lou, the robot's frozen, it's not working. We're gonna have dead air at the end of my show if we can't go from here. Um, that really helps kind of control how much I'm having to be on call for the station all the time. But, you know, stuff happens and that's what I'm here for. Um, Steven, I see, is your question the same that's in the chat here about permission? It's a new one. <laughs> it's a new one. Well, let me answer your first question and then I'll answer this next one here. So Steven in the chat asked what constitutes getting permission. I'm a huge fan of having it in writing. So essentially email is best. And if you verbally talk to somebody about it, I would write it down essentially and said, hey, I talked to, you know, Richie that I got their permission to use, you know, their poem on such and such a date for such and such a show. You know, this is just stuff that you keep in, in the files and you appreciate it when you need it is what I will say if you ever need to pull it up for some reason. Uh, what's your second question? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. That was my question. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. Um, Serena and Ada, you've got the question here of getting into the weeds. And I don't know if you guys are still here, but for the good of answering it, um, uh, what about free newspapers like Seven Days? Seems like reading a full article would be legit. So that counts as, as borderline snippet, full thing. And John, I don't know if you have an opinion about this coming from the print world. I would say that would be a violation of copyright because even if it's free, the newspaper is copyrighted. And if you're reading the whole article, it's more than just a snippet. Yeah. And actually, um, Rick followed up with me in a direct message and also to add to that said, they have their own audio content on their website as well. So they, they've, they've started making some audio content. And one of the things we could do is reach out and see if they wanted to have an articulation agreement where we could play their stuff. Many 
news sharing organizations are doing that. And so if we had an explicit uh, agreement with them, like, yeah, we're, we're making, they're making little two and four minute stories to listen to while you're washing the dishes or driving a couple blocks down the road. So I think it's a new thing for them. I'd like to encourage them to do that. And we could maybe do some mutual, mutually beneficial boosting of content and, and news around the state by building that bridge. So I think it's a cool idea. Let's, let's check it out, maybe. I, I agree. And, you know, part of this stuff, too, is um, as long as you give me just a heads up so I'm not kind of caught off guard if somebody reaches out to me, you know, and said, hey, this guy named Rick, you know, from GDR just asked if, you know, we can basically have this relationship that you were just talking about, Rick, with seven days, uh, that I'm all about helping, having you guys do this stuff on behalf of the station. But again, just making sure I'm in the heads up before something like that is initiated um, is, is greatly appreciated. Um, oh, Rick, your mic is off again. Open your mic. Rick. Absolutely, would not blindside you with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you would, I'm just saying, you know, carte blanche, you know, this, the community uh, needs to keep the station going and uplift in a lot of different ways. I mean, this is true also for like, if you're gonna go out and find five new underwriters, just drop me a quick email and say, hey, I'm gonna go talk to these five people about underwriting. Um, it's Vermont. There's so many overlaps that like, I, you know, I might walk into the general store and have somebody say, hey, I'm interested in the underwriting and like, you know, OK, great. Thanks for, you know, thank you. I'll take it to the finish line. I'd rather just have a heads up rather than, uh, you know, have to awkwardly, politely pretend like I know what they're talking about. You've all been there, I'm sure. Can I add just one quick point? The Creative Commons. Keep an eye out for the Creative Commons. There's more and more material on it because people want their stuff distributed. So, um, you know, I always check to see if they publish on the Creative Commons before I ask permission. But anyway, exactly. I'm off it. So that, that's a place on the internet, essentially. If you Google Creative Commons, it'll take you right there. There's like um, free instrumentals. There's a lot of, of uh, content on there that people, yeah, to Peter's point, want shared out there. Um, and again, you would just say this is from the Creative, you know, this is, so and so, you know, sourced from the Creative Commons. All right, we got two more minutes. Any other final questions that folks might have? Crickets. All right. Well, again, you all are rock stars. We're so excited to have you as part of our new family of uh, programmers. And uh, as you journey into your different paths in the forest here, um, we're excited to take you to the finish line and get you on the air with us sometime in April. Um, so have a wonderful rest of your night. This will be as a recording again um, via YouTube as a link tomorrow at some point to you all. So you can come back and revisit what people said during the panel at any time. So thank you all very much and see you later. Thank you.